This video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer, the perfect subscription box for fans of true crime, ARGs, or mystery solving in general. So given all that's going on in the world right now, you probably need a break from it all. I find my favorite way to do so is by spending time away from both the internet and any outside distractions in general. And if you haven't already tried it, I'd like to wholeheartedly recommend Hunt a Killer for a fun, analog, apocalypse-free time. Each box is a single episode in a wider storyline, containing clues that'll lead you little by little through each case. It's perfect on your own, with a partner, or even as a family. And best of all, it's way cheaper and these days safer than a night out. You can get your first box for 20% off if you head on over to huntakiller.com slash rainbot and use promo code rainbot. Again, that's huntakiller.com slash rainbot and promo code rainbot for 20% off your first box and happy hunting. In case the name Glico doesn't ring a bell, you might instead recognize one or maybe even a few of their world-famous products. While these are obviously what the brand is most known for, especially overseas, what you might not know is that Glico was once entwined in one of Japan's most harrowing mysteries. One that left parents across the country petrified. For tonight's unsolved case, we explore the Glico Morinaga case and its perpetrator, the monster with 21 faces. Izaki Glico, or better known as just Glico, is a confectionery company founded nearly 100 years ago in Osaka, Japan. By 1984, the company was in a transitional period in terms of leadership. Just two years prior, the company's founder would step down, only to be replaced by his son, a then 42-year-old man by the name of Katsuhisa Izaki. The relatively new CEO had a lot on his plate between raising his young family and continuing his father's legacy, but nothing could have prepared him for the night of March 18, 1984, or the subsequent nightmare that would last nearly a year and a half after that. At approximately 9 p.m., two armed intruders broke into the Izaki residence while Katsuhisa bathed. The two men first happened upon Mrs. Izaki and one of the couple's three children. They were both bound. Meanwhile, Katsuhisa, hearing the commotion, tried to remain unnoticed in the nearby bathroom with his two other children, but his efforts were ultimately in vain. The bathroom was stormed, the CEO captured, and just like that, he and his assailants were gone. Katsuhisa's family soon managed to escape and call police, but by that point, there was little the authorities could do but wait. A ransom request was made the very next morning, with the unidentified assailants asking for the equivalent of $4.3 million, along with 220 pounds of gold. A staggering amount for anyone, but one that would ultimately never have to be paid. Just three days later, Katsuhisa managed to escape completely unharmed, revealing to both police and the public that he'd been held in a warehouse in nearby Ibaraki City, not far from his own company's headquarters. Puzzlingly enough, the CEO also claimed that he managed to finally escape because he, for some reason, had been left unmonitored. For now, the nightmare seemed over, but regardless, the public was horrified at the news. Such corporate attacks were something that seemingly never happened in Japan, and to many it seemed like something that just couldn't. Little did they know, however, that this was really only the beginning of the madness, not just for Glico, but really for all of Japan. Almost a month after the taking of Katsuhisa Izaki, more bizarre events began to unfold for Glico. On April 10th, a number of vehicles outside the company HQ were inexplicably set on fire in a suspected arson case. Just under a week later, a container filled with hydrochloric acid was located in one of Glico's buildings, and as if that wasn't bad enough, it came with a note, solidifying the fact that these were the same people behind the kidnapping. Another month would pass, then things would escalate exponentially. In May of 1984, both Glico and local Osaka media received letters claiming that cyanide-laced packs of the company's candy would be placed on store shelves. The letters signed by a person or group choosing to be called the Monster with 21 Faces. The name, many assumed, was taken from the works of mystery writer Rampo Edogawa, specifically a character known as the Monster or Fiend with 20 Faces. 
It goes without saying that what happened next here was mass panic, and of course for good reason. Glico quickly pulled an estimated $21 million worth of product from store shelves across Japan, and as a result suffered a major financial blow with sales for that month ultimately dropping by half. Hundreds of workers were even laid off. Now, despite all the damage, however, no poison candies were actually found. Meanwhile, investigators were scrambling to crack the case, but the so-called monster with 21 faces was slippery and they knew it. As this was all going on, the letters did not stop. Many that were sent to the media were addressed directly to Japanese police, who the monster described as stupid and incompetent. The monster was so confident, or perhaps frustrated with police, that they even gave out hints, claiming that their getaway vehicle was grey and that they'd entered Glico's factory via the front gate in order to plant the container filled with acid, which they claimed was originally street garbage. The letters themselves became a defining characteristic of this case, but even with how frequent they were, they didn't offer any solid clues as to the monster's identity, aside from the fact that they seemed local based on the dialect that was used. There did, however, appear to be one possible break in the case after Glico's products had been recalled. This man was spotted on CCTV, seemingly placing something onto a store shelf. It is a bit difficult to make out, but the man here is wearing a business suit and glasses along with a Tokyo Yomiuri Giants baseball cap. To this day, this remains the only piece of actual footage associated with this case, but whoever is depicted in it, the so-called videotaped man, has never been identified or even formally connected to the person or group who calls themselves the monster with 21 faces. On June 26, at the height of all the chaos and confusion, Something even more bizarre took place. Another letter had turned up, but this time it seemingly claimed that the monster was done with Glico. The note, addressed to the people of Japan, said, The president of Glico has already gone around with his head hanging down long enough. We would like to forgive him. Japan has gotten terribly hot and humid, so when our work is done, we want to go to Europe. Geneva, Paris, London. We'll be in one of those places. Let's bring Pocky, the traveler's friend. Delicious Glico products. We're eating them too. See you in January of next year. Keep in mind, this came out of nowhere after months of harassment from the group, and it even came without any money being exchanged. This, of course, would seem ultimately bizarre and a waste of time if not for the fact that the monster really hadn't stopped at all. In fact, it had already started targeting other brands, including one Marudai food company, with much the same tactics it had already used with Glico. Once again, ransom was demanded in exchange for peace, and unlike Glico, Marudai was ready to comply, but with a catch. On June 28th, just two days after the monster announced an end to its obsession with Glico, Marudai was set to deliver its payment. Instead of sending over a company employee like requested, however, an undercover police officer was tasked with the job. While on the train to the specified drop location, the undercover cop picked up on a man that seemed to be following him. Said man was described as having a larger build, short hair, glasses, and most notably, eyes said to resemble those of a fox. The undercover cop was instructed to keep an eye out for a white flag, the signal to drop the money, but since that flag never appeared, the cop continued on the route until its eventual end in Kyoto. He was only there long enough to hop on the next available train back to Osaka, and sure enough, the fox-eyed man boarded the exact same train. This time, the detective decided to instead disembark at Takotsuki, the middle point between Osaka and Kyoto, at which point the fox-eyed man disembarked as well and then boarded a train heading back to Kyoto yet again. Now the cop was the one following him, but the fox-eyed man managed to slip away. Following this incident, more chaos would continue with other food companies like Fujia and House Foods getting sucked into the massive blackmailing scheme. Out of all of these corporations, one company in particular would be the target of arguably the worst attack of this whole case, Morinaga, the other half of the Glico Morinaga case. In early October of 1984, the monster with 21 faces would strike again, this time sending a letter to the media addressed directly to mothers across Japan. 
And needless to say, what was said in the letter was extremely alarming. Much like with the earlier Glico incident in May, mass panic set in and products were recalled. Only, this time, the monster wasn't bluffing. Several packs of Morinaga products were found with additional labels on them reading, Danger Contains Poison, signed The Monster with 21 Faces. And sure enough, these candies did indeed test positive for poison. In response, a staggering 40,000 Japanese police officers were set to watch over supermarkets and convenience stores in the hopes of catching one of the culprits in the act, maybe even preventing the worst from ever even taking place. This massive deployment, however, much like all of the other police efforts, ultimately resulted in nothing, and the Japanese public would close 1984 in fear. By Valentine's Day of 1985, more laced products had been uncovered, and it became clear that the monster was not letting up. Meanwhile, however, on the seemingly more positive side of things, around this time, police had finally zeroed in on a prime suspect, a man by the name of Manabu Miyazaki, who was identified following the January release of the composite sketch of the fox-eyed man from the train. This was really the first bit of actual progress in this almost year-long case, and it seemed promising. The man, by his own admission, claimed to be an outlaw with ties to local Yakuza, and on top of it all, he even look like the fox-eyed man. But much like everything else in this case, this too led nowhere as Miyazaki denied the allegations and even had alibis that seemed to prove his innocence. His name was ultimately cleared and everyone moved on, or at least tried to. In August of 1985, things were still at a standstill and the Japanese public were furious with law enforcement's perceived incompetence. The pressure was too much for one man in particular who had worked on the case, Superintendent Shoji Yamamoto, who tragically out of shame set himself on fire and would ultimately pass away. The monster, meanwhile, had been watching all of this and reappeared several days later. But unbeknownst to the Japanese people at the time, this would be the end. No career Yamamoto died like a man, so we decided to give our condolences. We decided to forget about torturing food-making companies. If anyone blackmails any of the food-making companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. The monster ultimately made good on their word and did not strike again. Just like that, it was all over. But even so, people were still left with no answers, no real reason for why all this had even happened or who was behind it. Who was the fox-eyed man? And was he the same person spotted placing candy onto a store shelf? Were these two men actually not involved at all? Over the duration of the Glico Morinaga case, Endless amounts of theories emerged, citing everything from a disgruntled ex-employee all the way to Japanese communist groups. But the monster's true motivations are still unknown to this day. If you think about everything that happened, it almost comes off like the monster with 21 faces didn't actually want to hurt anyone or even make money for that matter. Why place labels on tainted goods? Why not actually collect on the money? Why leave the CEO unmonitored which allowed for his escape? That we don't know, but what we do know is that whoever the monster is or was, they really had a bone to pick with the authorities, and one might argue that most of their statements were made specifically to outline the incompetence of Japanese police, a criticism that still lasts into the modern day. As mentioned earlier, it's highly likely that the monster took his name from the Fiend with 20 Faces, and it's not just the name that gives it away. The Fiend is a master of disguise, someone who can blend in in plain sight, who's also known for laughing in the face of police. He's the type of criminal that normal cops just aren't good enough to catch on their own without the help of a top detective. In the end, we're never going to know what the monster really wanted. Was it to make a point to society or to play out his very own detective fantasy in real life? The answers remain unclear, but what's troubling to think about is that the monster with 21 faces could still be alive today, and much like the fiend, the monster remains unseen. So if you made it this far, I just want to thank you for watching, and in case you want more videos like this, feel free to check out the playlist. And if you happen to have any suggestions for topics, I'd be happy to take a look at them if you email me at writingbotinbox at gmail.com. This video, of course, would not be possible without the help of each and every one of my Patreon supporters, but especially these people.
AJ Runaway, Astro, Base of Shadow, Bloody the Elf, Borealis Knight, Catherine L, Connor H, Quirky Barks, Daniel G, David G, Isaac, Eric M, Esper Nix, Fern, Gel Forel, Chris M, Lance, Mortal Nat, Psycho, Roxanne S, Sean the CHB, Tyler T, Ulysses, Aaron V, Amelia J, Andrew L, Benjamin M, Eric H, Francisco B, It's Mitt, YOLO for Jesus, Jake M, James M, Joel H, Keith Z, Luck B, Matt J, Melody, Nick B, S. Estratus, Gorian S, Sophie A, Sydney G, T. Gorman, Tristan J, Zarai, and A. J. M. Thank you all so much for your support, and to everyone else, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all again soon.